Hi there, my highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners, and welcome back to your channel of choice. My name is Dr. Nath Arwa, and I am a clinical pharmacist by training and by profession, and I am the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, a premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The virtual clinical pharmacy institute with a difference where patient safety, medication therapy management, and optimal clinical outcomes are very, very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So I humbly urge you to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you some precious tips which may prove handy in your line of duty. So welcome to part 77 of our pharmacotherapy MCQ series, Majoring in Toxicology. The first question reads, Mr. BMW, a middle-aged male patient, is rushed to your accident and emergency department by his spouse after a reported amitriptyline overdose, a tricyclic antidepressant. My question to you is, which of the EKG or ECG changes listed below is commonly observed in such cases of TCA toxicity? Is it wide QRS interval? Is it the deep S wave in lead one? Is it a scooped ST segment? Or is it a bundle branch block? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. Both A and B would be observed. There's a wide QRS interval with a deep S wave in lead one. Now, amitriptyline, a tricyclic antidepressant, uh, its toxicity may cause a widening of the QRS interval and uh, a rightward rotation of terminal QRS axis showing up as an S or deep S wave in lead one due to inhibition of the cardiac fast sodium channels, that is the inward current whereby sodium from the outward of the cardiac myocytes flows or moves into the cell, thereby making the inside of the cell more positive or less negative. Now, I would like to add that sinus predicardia, PR prolongation, a variable AV block, junctional rhythm, bundle bunch blocks and uh, so on and so forth are typically seen with the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers so D was meant to mislead you or to trick you I would like to add that common ECG changes with beta blockers in cases of toxicity include sinus bradycardia PR elongation variable AV block, junctional rhythms, bundle branch blocks, and QRS prolongation. Now the ECG changes with detoxin toxicity, just for your information, may include scooped ST waves. So C was meant to trick you, that would apply to detoxin. Apart from that, uh, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia with AV nodal block can occur. You can have junctional rhythm, you can have sinus bradycardia, they can also be Vita, can be Fib, and even bradyarrhythmias in case of digoxin toxicity. Then the ECG changes which may occur with the tricyclic antidepressants include PR interval prolongation, wide QRS, deep S wave in lead 1, an R wave in the AVR, greater than 3 mm and an R or S wave ratio sorry an R to S wave ratio in the AVR above 0 0.7 I'd just like to emphasize that amitriptyline marketed as Elavil is a tertiary TCA tricyclic antidepressant which inhibits the reuptake of serotonin more than norepinephrine compared to the secondary TCS, for example, which inhibit the reuptake of uh, norepinephrine more than serotonin, making the secondary TCS 
less likely uh, to cause sedation compared to tertiary agents. That's just a by the way. And I would like to repeat that uh, widening of the QRS interval more than uh, to more than 100 milliseconds under uh, the RAVR to more than 3 mm and the R to S ratio place patients at a high risk for seizures and cardiac arrhythmia. So the doctor or the physician should look at all those values and uh, act swiftly to avoid complications with the cardiac arrhythmias. That's just, uh, by the way, let's move to the next question, please. The next question reads, your clinical team at the accident and emergency department frequently manages paracetamol poisoning in cases of attempted suicide. My question to you is, when is it advisable to initiate IV N-acetylcysteine uh, therapy following such cases of acetaminophen overdose? Is it within 6 hours, within 8 hours, within 2 hours, or within 4 hours? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct timing. It should be within eight hours. Now, N-acetylcysteine, abbreviated as NAC, NAC, should be administered within eight hours of acetaminophen overdose. Now, the concern with acetaminophen or paracetamol overdose is for oversaturating phase two metabolic pathways, resulting in the production of NAPK via the CYP2E1 system which depletes glutathione causing oxidative damage to hepatocytes among other tissues now oral NAC therapy oral nano system therapy is uh, dosed at uh, 140 milligrams per kilo as a loading dose followed by 70 milligrams per kilo dose starting four hours later which can then be given at four hour intervals for a total of 17 doses and the entire oral regimen lasts 72 hours underline that now IV NAC treatment IV n acetylcysteine treatment is 150 milligrams per kilo in 200 ml of dexos 5 it fused over 60 minutes followed by 50 milligrams per kilo diluted in 500 ml of 5% dextrose infused over 4 hours, then uh, lastly 100 milligrams per kilo diluted in a liter of 5% dextrose and infused over 16 hours. This entire regimen lasts 21 hours, just for your information. Let's move to the next question. And it reads, by which of the mechanisms listed below? Does alcohol cause thiamine deficiency in patients suffering from chronic alcoholism? Is it true that alcohol binds or chelates thiamine in the stomach and prevents its absorption from the stomach? Is it true that alcohol decreases the gene expression of thiamine transporter 1 in the small intestines? Or is it true that alcohol results in decreased bowel transit time for absorption? of thiamine or is it true that alcohol directly inhibits thiamine transport in the enterocytes of the small intestines i'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer B is the correct answer. Alcohol decreases the gene expression of thiamine transporter 1 in the small intestines. Now, chronic alcohol abuse impairs the transportation of thiamine from the intestines. And it appears that alcohol has the ability to impair the entry of thiamine into the enterocytes lining the brush border membrane, which lines the luminal uh, part of the 
jejunium. Now alcohol can impair the movement of thiamine from within the enterocyte of the small intestines through the basolateral side where it would normally enter into the portal circulation for delivery into the other parts of the body. Now, I would like to remind you that uh, animal studies suggest that uh, the impairment across the brush border membrane within the lumen appears to be due to alcohol's ability to reduce the gene expression for thiamine transporter 1, which we abbreviate as THTR-1, but not thiamine transporter 2, which is abbreviated as THTR-2. Now, this means that the number of thiamine transporters required to bring thiamine into the enterocyte was decreased. And as such, even though thiamine was present in the intestinal tract, it uh, wasn't being absorbed in the presence of alcohol. Now, within the large intestines, it was noted in the animal studies that uh, absorption was also inhibited. And this was due in part to a reduction in gene expression of both THTR-1 and THTR-2. Therefore, this suggests that alcohol may have tissue-specific effect on thiamine transport and distribution. Now, while this data comes from animal models, it appears to be consistent with what is seen clinically in patients suffering from chronic alcoholism and uh, if such patients are left untreated, um, they are at an increased risk of the Reniske Korsakoff syndrome, which could be lethal if left unattended to. Let's move to the next question, please. It reads Which of the supportive care measures listed below would increase the effectiveness of the strategy of? combination chelation therapy using dimacapro and added calcium disodium. Is it phosphodiuresis? Is it hyperbaric oxygen? Is it urinary alkalinization? Or is it urinary acidification? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. C is the correct answer, urinary alkalinization. Now, this alkalinization to a pH of 7.5 to 8 should be targeted to prevent dimacapro uh, lead dissociation, which can occur in acidic urine. Now, remember that chelation must remain contact, that complex must remain contact. If urine is acidic, it will dissociate and uh, getting rid of the lead would be a challenge. Now, sodium bicarbonate should be administered with dimacaprol and added calcium disodium for urinary alkalinization when managing lead toxicity. Severe toxic exposure can be treated with urinary alkalinization and that applies to lead, to aspirin, to methotrexate and even phenobarbital. I would like to emphasize that potassium should be monitored since clinically significant hypokalemia can occur with sodium bicarbonate use in toxicology. And I would also like, like to add that appropriate hydration but not forced diuresis should be achieved for dimacaprol use just as a precaution. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, your emergency medicine consultant plans to initiate a 25-year-old patient suffering from Wilson's disease on D-penicillamine therapy. As the clinical pharmacist based at the accident emergency department, you review the patient's medication chart and note he has an allergy to penicillin V potassium. And uh, you are informed it caused a rash and nausea. So my question to you is, which action listed below would be the most appropriate to take in this particular clinical scenario? Would you initiate DMP 
S, would you discontinue Dimaca Pro? Would you decontinue the penicillamine? Would you initiate a desensitization protocol with penicillin G? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. take a risk and continue d penicillamine now although d penicillamine is a metabolite of penicillin uh, there is limited risk of cross reactivity though it isn't zero and so a type of reaction can be determined if it is used now given that uh, this patient's reported reaction doesn't consist of a life-threatening anaphylaxis. Uh, in my opinion, the benefits of deep penicillamine outweigh risks in this particular clinical scenario. I would like to add that deep penicillamine should be used with caution in patients with penicillin allergy given its limited risk of cross-reactivity. Remember, D penicillamine is a third line chelating agent for lead, mercury, and arsenic toxicity. Now, I would also like to point the fact that agranulocytosis, drug induced lupus, lupus and uh, severe nausea, and even mobiliform rash are quoted in literature as concerning adverse events associated with short-term use of d penicillamine now the long-term adverse events that are quoted in literature include leukopenia thrombocytopenia myasthenia gravis zinc deficiency acute renal failure and even pulmonary toxicity so use it very cautiously look out for those adverse reactions or events even as you manage this toxicity. Let's move to the next question, please. Which reads, uh, Miss TJL, 16 and a half year old girl is rushed to your hospital by an ambulance. She has a past medical history of depression. She's previously attempted to commit suicide by overdosing herself. And uh, her father found her in the bedroom with a bottle labeled Imipramine. Now, the nurse does a 12 lead ECG which shows uh, the QRS appears widened and uh, it measures 125 milliseconds. So my question to you is which is the occurrence of a wide QRS common on the ECG of such a patient? Is it an inhibition of phase zero by reducing the movements of calcium inside the cell? Is it a decrease in sodium influx coming through phase zero? Is it a decrease in the movement of sodium inside the cell through phase four? Or is it an increase in sodium influx coming through phase zero and potassium moving in, sorry, moving out into phase three? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So it's the issue of a decrease in sodium influx coming through phase zero. Now tricyclic antidepressants affect phase zero of the action potential within the ventricular myocyte, thereby delaying the polarization and this causes the widening of the QRS interval that is observed. Now, there are no antiarrhythmic medications that target phases 4, 1, and 2, as I said earlier, of the action potential in the cardiac myocyte. And I would like to repeat that uh, tricyclic antidepressants have a class 1A antiarrhythmic effect and they decrease sodium influx coming through phase 0 and potassium moving out in phase 3 creating a widening in QRS now widening of the QRS interval beyond the 100 milliseconds 
of the RAVR beyond 3 millimeters or the R to S wave ratio place the patient with the tricyclic antidepressant overdose at a high risk of seizures and even cardiac arrhythmia. So be very careful. Look out for those. Now phase 0 of the action potential is the ventricular myocytes in the ventricular myocytes, sorry, reflects a sodium inward movement, which is different from the nodal potential where sodium inward current occurs in phase 4. So just note that the two tissues behave differently. Now phase 1 of the action potential in the ventricular myocyte reflects potassium outward movement and phase 2 of the action potential in the ventricular myocyte reflects a calcium inward movement while phase 3 uh, reflects a potassium outward movement and uh, these phases of action potential in the ventricular myocyte reflect sodium and potassium exchange resulting in a neutral effect. Let's move to the next question. The next question reads, Mr. H.A.W., a 60-year-old man, is rushed to your accident and emergency department following clomipramine or anaphranil overdose. This is a tricyclic antidepressant. He now has a seizure and his bedside blood glucose monitor shows glucose of 92 milligrams per deciliter and EKG isn't done due to the seizure activity. He's not still, he's moving around quite a bit and the graph won't be traced appropriately. So my question too is which of the following options would be the most appropriate initial treatment for this gentleman? Do you administer propofol, lorazepam, phosphenitoin or would you settle for hemodialysis? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. would administer lorazepam and I'll tell you why. Benzodiazepines are the drugs of choice in the management of a patient with seizures and a tricyclic antidepressant toxicity and uh, lorazepam to be specific marketed as etivan or midazolam marketed as domicam or versed or even diazepam marketed as valium would all be appropriate options to use in this particular clinical scenario. Now, since phenytoin and phosphenytoin can also inhibit sodium channels in the cardiac muscles, just like in the CNS, uh, I would like to warn you never to administer phenytoin or phosphenytoin in tricyclic antidepressant toxicity, since they can worsen the risk of developing cardiac dysrhythmias. Avoid them totally. Now, If the patient isn't responding to initial benzodiazepine therapy, then consider propofol or even phenobarbital. I would like to add that uh, hemodialysis will not be effective in the management of uh, tricyclic antidepressant toxicity due to the fact that the TCAs have very large volumes of distribution. Now, benzodiazepines potentiate the inhibitory neuromas neurotransmitter, sorry, GABA, to manage seizures with the tricyclic antidepressant toxicity without interfering with the cardiac conduction or even the action potential, unlike phenytoin or phosphenytoin, which have the ability to do so and would worsen such a clinical situation. Now, I'd like to emphasize that key initial treatment goals are to get the QRS to be lower 100. Remember our gentleman here I think had exceeded 110 and uh, we should also maintain pH between 7.5 and 7. Point, sorry 7.45 and 7.55 just to survive the way. Let's move to the next question please. The next question reads, Mr. PPL, a middle-aged male patient, is rushed to your accident and emergency department after he overdoses amitriptyline. 
Now according to his EKG, he has a wide QRS interval exceeding 100 milliseconds even after the clinical team administers sodium bicarbonate. His blood pressure is 165 systolic and 90 diastolic. So my question to you is, which of the treatment options listed below would be the most appropriate for Mr. PPL now now? Would you choose to administer norepinephrine? Would you choose to correct magnesium levels if they are too low? Would you use lipid emulsion therapy or would you set for hemodialysis for at least six hours? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So I'd opt to correct the magnesium levels if they are low and also use lipid emulsion therapy. Now lipid emulsion therapy may be effective when QRS isn't improving with other treatments for tricyclic antidepressant toxicity. Now treating deficiencies in magnesium, potassium and calcium is important since they all have been shown to worsen Q prolongation so remember that now hemodialysis won't be effective management of tricyclic antidepressant toxicity due to the fact that they have very large volumes of distribution and therefore they are not very highly dialyzable then I would like to add that norepinephrine is effective when the patient develops hypotension from tricyclic antidepressant toxicity and is unresponsive to fluids and uh, then lipid emulsion therapy creates what we call a lipid sink and it is effective in tricyclic antidepressant toxicity since the TCAs are lipophilic and they have large volumes of distribution now when doing a workup in any patient with the uh, concerns of uh, suicide attempt or uh, overdose, always consider evaluation of other medications that may cause other complications, such as, uh, say, acetaminophen levels may be relevant, salicylate levels may be relevant, you may even need to do a urine toxicology screen, and so on and so forth. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, which of the statements listed below correctly outlines the toxic effect of paracetamol when ingested in a suicide attempt or during an overdose. Does it recruit leukocytes, neutrophils, and monocytes leading to hepatic toxicity? Does it deplete glutathione leading to oxidative damage of the hepatocytes? Does it damage mitochondrial DNA resulting in hepatocellular necrosis or does it decrease gastric pH resulting in gastritis? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So it depletes glutathione leading to oxidative damage of the hepatocytes. I would like to start by saying that n p benzoquinone imine, which is abbreviated as NAPQI, N -A -P -Q -I, is the toxic metabolite form and it comes from excessive amounts of acetaminophen and results in depletion of glutathione. Now glutathione depletion by NAPQI results in oxidative damage to surrounding cells and even organs where it is present which may include the GIT, the liver and the kidneys. Now the concern with acetaminophen or paracetamol overdose is for oversaturating phase 2 metabol metabolic sorry, pathways which results in production of this NAPQI via the CYP2E1 and that causes depletion of the glutathione causing oxidative damage to various cells, especially the hepatocytes. 
and uh, I would like to add that acetaminophen overdose in chronic alcoholics is worsened by the upregulation of ship 2 e one leading to a likelihood of generating napki metabolites. Now, the glutathione levels may be low due to poor nutritional status in these alcoholics, and that would worsen things even further. Now, n acetyl system rep replenishes, sorry, glutathione and should be administered within eight hours of paracetamol overdose just to survive the way. Our next question reads Mrs. L. I. B., a 57 year old female weighing 68 kilos, presents to your accident and emergency department with an altered mental status. And uh, we are told she received an appropriate amount of digifab after it was established that she had an acute on chronic digoxin toxicity. Now the digifab dose was completed 12 hours ago, but uh, Mrs. LIB still has persistent altered mental status and she is tachycardic. She has uh, atrial fibrillation. And her body temperature is 100.0.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, on rechecking the digoxin levels, a value of 22.4 nanograms per ml is reported by the lab. So my question to you is, which of the steps listed below would be the next best course of action? Would it be? All the place, 0 0.9 milligrams per kilo IV dosed in such a manner that 10% is administered as a bolus with the remainder being infused over one hour or is it true that no treatment is indicated now so we should continue monitoring instead or would you choose to administer 13 vials of digifab IV start and then repeat digoxin levels eight hours later or would you opt to administer 20 vials of digifab iv start and repeat the digoxin levels eight hours later i'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer So at this stage, no treatment is indicated. I would continue monitoring instead. Now, follow-up digoxin levels shouldn't be obtained as uh, we know that total serum concentrations will rise predominantly following the administration of DigiFab. And this is due to the presence of uh, the FAB digoxin complex. The bound FAB fragments can't result in toxicity but the ri there is, uh, this rise has no clinical significance. Remember, it binds with the free one, some is released from the muscles, and it binds, and so on, and so on, and so forth. Now, digoxin binds to the sodium potassium ATP channel, leading to improved sodium calcium exchange. And the result is improved muscle contraction, prolonged relaxation. And uh, hyperkalemia can be used as a marker of digoxin toxicity because it can happen when it's overdosed. And it develops from uh, the excessive sodium, potassium, ATPase inhibition, which leads to high extracellular potassium concentrations. Now, I'd just like to remind you that Digifab can be used to treat toxicities from other cardiac glycosides as well which includes those from natural or plant-based injections such as the Olendra plant the O-L-E-N-D-E-R it's a herbal plant so there you have it my highly esteemed viewers and listeners that brings us to the end of this video if this video benefited you in any way I would like to kindly urge you to give it a thumbs up and to like it and to share it widely with your peers and if you haven't yet done so i humbly urge you to subscribe to my youtube channel 
I would like to promise you all that the very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video and for listening to me. I sincerely appreciate your partnership and your continued support and very kind collaboration. And I look forward to interacting with you in the next video. Thank you very much.